Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is May 31, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 75. Here in the United States, today is a major holiday, Memorial Day. For most of us, it's a day off from our jobs, a day for picnics or to visit friends and relatives. The Memorial Day weekend is famous for traffic jams, highway accidents, and the Indianapolis 500 Auto Race. A Memorial Day is a seasonal turning point, marking the beginning of the traditional summer vacation season. Most of us tend to welcome Memorial Day as the gateway to summer, but Memorial Day also has a more solemn meaning which we sometimes forget. It's the day we have set aside to honor the servicemen who have died fighting for our country. Memorial Day is a reminder that war has become a stark reality for America time after time, and each time the cost in human lives has been tragic. As I look ahead to the summer of 1982 now beginning, it's with mixed feelings. Like most other Americans, I'm looking forward to the activities that make the summer vacation season a time to enjoy but the summer ahead will also be a time of increasing danger for America. The timetable for nuclear war which I made public three months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 72 is still in effect, my friends. That timetable calls for NUCLEAR WAR 1 to erupt by mid-September 1982, barely three months from now. The American Bolsheviks who now control the United States Pentagon are not slowing down in their war preparations. This is true in spite of the fact that part of their war plan has been crippled as I detailed last month. The covert warfare that spawned the so-called Falklands Crisis has all but ruined the Pentagon plans for final victory in the coming war, but the Bolshevik war planners here have a suicidal streak in their thinking, and they are bent on war regardless of the consequences. As I say these words, headlines are growing larger and larger about the Falklands War between Argentina and Britain. Since I spoke to you last month, heavy losses have been reported on both sides. Argentina has lost her only cruiser, the General Belgrano, plus several minor vessels and a number of aircraft. Britain has so far admitted losing five major ships, two destroyers, two frigates, and a container ship full of war material. These reports reflect the scale of the present fighting somewhat, but they are incomplete and distorted. As in every war, the truth has become the first casualty. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1. The Pentagon Countdown Toward Nuclear War 1 Topic No. 2. The Economic Attack on the United States Constitution, and Topic No. 3, Billy Graham vs. the Bolshevik War Lobby. Topic No. 1. In AUDIO LETTER No. 73 two months ago, I revealed that an entire new nuclear war strategy against Russia is being developed here in Washington. It is being worked out by an elite military planning group in extreme secrecy under the code name Project Z. It's a rush project calling for NUCLEAR WAR 1 itself to begin by September of this year, 1982. Last month I reported that Project Z was continuing to move fast at the Secret War Planning Room here in downtown Washington. As I stated, the process of fleshing out the basic war plan was already underway. Now my friends, the first complete draft of the total Project Z war plan is ready. The plan is essentially completed, with nothing left to do but make minor refinements here and there, and now the existence of this major new United States nuclear war plan is creeping into the news. Just yesterday, May 30, an article about it appeared for the very first time in the New York Times. The article by Richard Halloran carries the headline Pentagon draws up first strategy for fighting a long nuclear war. The article begins, quote, Defense Department policymakers in a new five-year defense plan 
have accepted the premise that nuclear conflict with the Soviet Union could be protracted, and have drawn up their first strategy for fighting such a war." Unquote. The article goes on to mention that the plan is laid out in an unpublished document of 125 pages. It's been drafted for approval by Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. My friends, I've reported many times now that the United States Pentagon is controlled by the Bolsheviks who formerly controlled Russia. I've also identified Weinberger as the highest visible agent of the Bolsheviks here in the United States Government today. The nuclear war plans of the Bolsheviks here are moving fast, but as I have also reported before, the United States Government today is a house divided. The Bolsheviks are opposed by their bitter rivals, the Rockefeller Cartel. Their top visible operative in the Federal Government today is Secretary of State Alexander Haig. The often visible feuding between Haig and Weinberger is only a pale shadow of this deadly power struggle behind the scenes. Unlike the Bolsheviks here, the Rockefeller faction do not want nuclear war. In a word, they cannot afford it. They would lose everything, and so the Rockefeller faction here is working feverishly to head off the Bolshevik nuclear war plan. The new anti-Bolshevik rulers of Russia are also against nuclear war. The anti-Bolshevik, anti-nuclear war attitudes of the Rockefeller Cartel and the Kremlin has led to a limited coalition between them in recent months. The most spectacular result so far from this Rockefeller-Russian coalition is the Falklands War now raging between Argentina and Britain. In AUDIO LETTER No. 74 last month, I reported what the Falklands War is all about. It is the visible aftermath to covert warfare which took place during April. The Rockefeller Cartel and the Russians joined forces to destroy certain major military installations and weapons reserves. These were key ingredients in the final phase of the Project Z war plan. The whole operation began at South Georgia Island on April 3. With the help of Argentina, a joint Rockefeller-Russian commando team was able to knock out the giant hidden naval base there. The base, built during the 1960s, was originally controlled through the United States Government by the Rockefeller Cartel, but the Bolsheviks here acquired control of the bases about three years ago when they seized control of the American Pentagon. Last month I detailed how the attack on the base was carried out. It was contained within a giant man-made cavern hollowed out inside a mountain near the water. With the camouflage ship entrances sealed up, the base was bomb-proof, but the joint Rockefeller-Russian commando team succeeded in attacking the base by drilling a shaft through the mountain. Then a compact Russian neutron bomb was inserted through the shaft and detonated inside the cavernous naval base. The process took several weeks. The Thatcher Government, which like the United States Pentagon is Bolshevik controlled, dispatched the Royal Navy. First, it was supposed to dislodge the heavily armed Rockefeller Russia military force before it could destroy the naval base. Then it was to move on to the Falklands for the publicly admitted fighting. The Royal Navy arrived several days too late to save the secret base on South Georgia Island, as I reported last month, but by that time the panicking Thatcher Government had already committed some two-thirds of the Royal Navy to the South Atlantic. On top of that, at least one British ship had already been sunk by Russia in connection with the secret South Georgia operation. That left the Thatcher Government with no choice but to engage Argentina in battle. Otherwise it would have been impossible to explain away Britain's huge deployment to the South Atlantic, much less the heavy losses which had been sustained. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 74 last month on April 30, the British blockade of the Falklands was just beginning. Later that day the entity President Reagan announced that the United States was actively siding with Britain. The announcement was a victory for the Pentagon War Faction. Right away warfare around the Falklands started heating up fast. 
On May 1 the British launched bombing raids against the airport at Port Stanley, and on May 2 a British submarine torpedoed Argentina's second largest ship, the cruiser General Belgrano. It sank within 24 hours, leaving a death toll of more than 300 Argentine sailors. The sinking of the Belgrano was expected to demoralize the Argentines, but instead it enraged them. The Belgrano had been sunk at a time when it was not threatening the British forces. The Argentines decided it was time to start playing their ace in the hole against Britain. Last month I reported that Argentina had been given certain promises in return for making the secret South Georgia operation possible. One of these was the promise of covert military assistance by Russia against Britain. Specifically, it was pledged that the Russians would intervene in parallel with Argentine air and naval operations in ways designed to even the odds. In this way, Argentina's military leaders can take full credit for both their own and covert Russian attacks on the British. At the same time, this procedure is designed to keep Russia's role in the fighting obscure. On May 4, the Argentine Air Force decided to put Russia's promises to the test. A pair of fighter bombers headed out over the Atlantic to attack the Royal Navy. Acting on reconnaissance data provided by Russian spy satellites, they headed straight for the fleet. As the two low-flying Argentine jets appeared on the horizon, they were picked up by British fleet radar. At the same time, a Russian Cosmosphere hovering many miles above the fleet took final aim at one of the ships. The ship was one of Britain's newest, most modern, most sophisticated ships, designed specifically to shield the fleet against air attack. The ship was a Type 42 guided missile destroyer, HMS Sheffield. Long before the two Argentine jets were close enough to attack, the Cosmosphere fired its charged Particle Beam weapon downward at the ship. The white-hot beam of subatomic particles blasted through the aluminum superstructure just behind the bridge near the top of the ship. In a split second the beam seared through layers of metal downward into the bowels of the ship. The aluminum of the ship itself was instantly ablaze. The Argentine fighter pilots witnessed the spectacular explosion and intense white flames from nearly 20 miles away. They promptly turned back toward home, having expended no missiles. Bewildered survivors from the Sheffield later said there had been no warning before the blast. Argentina's leaders are being coached by Rockefeller Cartel operatives in what to say publicly about war developments. They claim that a French-made missile called the Exocet had been used to sink the Sheffield. But to those who know the characteristics of the Exocet missile, the Sheffield disaster remained a mystery. The Exocet, my friends, is a type of missile known as a sea skimmer. It's designed to skim along just above the water, striking a ship almost at the waterline. File films of the Exocet which have been shown on TV clearly show this behavior but the Sheffield was blasted close to the very top of the superstructure. In fact, that is said to be the reason for the relatively low casualty toll in the destruction of HMS Sheffield. Had the same blast been aimed low, close to the waterline, the ship probably would have heeled over and sunk fast. Had that happened, very few of the crew would have escaped. On the evening of May 4, Admiral Martin Weems, former Director of the British Naval Warfare, was interviewed about the Sheffield disaster on ABC Nightline. Ted Koppel began with the words, Admiral Weems, how is it that such a modern ship would not have been able to first of all detect and then destroy that Argentine aircraft? Admiral Weems answered, quote, I think that's an extremely good question, and I cannot give you a straight answer. In my book, this should not have happened." Unquote. For the next two weeks talks between Argentina and Britain continued, with United Nations Secretary General Perez de Cuellar attempting to mediate. Meanwhile the Thatcher Government continued to add to the British Armada in the South Atlantic. 
Even the luxury liner Queen Elizabeth II was commandeered and turned into a troop ship. It sailed with some 3,200 troops aboard on May 12. The strategy of the Bolshevik-dominated Thatcher Government is very simple, my friends. They know very well they are sending the Royal Navy into a trap, but they believe that by multiplying naval strength in the South Atlantic virtually beyond reason, they will win. They are making the British commitment so huge compared to that of Argentina that a total Argentine rout of the British would look unreasonable. It would enable the question of covert Russian aid to Argentina to be raised openly and credibly, and that could help to set off the very nuclear war which they know Russia is trying to avoid. Following this brute force strategy, the Thatcher Government has continued to pour every available ship into the South Atlantic fray. As of now, over 100 British ships are either in the war zone or heading toward it. That's almost the entire Royal Navy. The attitude is, for every ship the Russians and Argentinians sink, the Thatcher Government will just send two more, anything to make sure Britain retakes the Falklands, because if that is not accomplished, the Thatcher Government will fall, and that will be a setback to Bolshevik power in Britain. On May 19 the last-ditch talks at the United Nations finally collapsed. Britain was ready at last to invade. After talks ended that evening, it was announced that the British War Cabinet would meet the following morning. Supposedly the meeting would decide whether to give the go-ahead for invasion, but it was all a ruse to help create an element of surprise against Argentina and against Russia. The first stage of an elaborate invasion strategy was already going into action. On the evening of May 19 the British invasion fleet was divided up into two groups. One group was 150 miles due east of Port Stanley, the other 100 miles to the northeast. Shortly before midnight Washington time, both invasion forces started heading towards shore. Russian Cosmospheres and submarines went into action, working together. Both British assault groups came under fire. At least two ships critical to an assault were hit and heavily damaged. By 2 a.m. Washington time, both assault forces aborted their moves toward the Port Stanley area. In response, Russian forces disengaged. The Russians believed they had thwarted the British invasion, but, my friends, they were wrong. The two large invasion groups threatening Port Stanley the night of May 19 were actually carrying out a diversionary action. British strategists knew that the Russians had the muscle available to stop any invasion. The only chance of success lay in convincing the Russians that they had stopped the invasion and then somehow sneaking troops ashore. So the two large invasion forces of May 19 actually were staging a decoy action. Most of the British invasion troops were no longer aboard the troop carrier Canberra or the assault ships. Instead they had been transferred to other ships which normally are not used for amphibious purposes. On the morning of May 20 the elaborate British deception continued. Up until the previous day British statements had been referring to an imminent all-out invasion, but on the morning of May 20 the statements changed abruptly. British Defense Ministry spokesmen suddenly started saying that the British would confine themselves to small hit-and-run raids for a while. The Bolshevik military planners in London wanted to further convince Russia that the invasion had been stopped the previous night. It worked. Small groups of British ships began moving around the Falklands as if to plant small raiding parties here and there. In the early morning darkness of May 21, one of these small groups of ships moved into the north end of Falkland Sound between the islands. Contrary to press reports, the troop ship Canberra was not among them nor was an assault ship. Those ships would have tipped off the Russians, monitoring everything from Cosmospheres far above that a major landing was afoot. Instead the key ship that moved into San Carlos Bay was the hospital ship Uganda. Under cover of darkness the Uganda moved close to shore. British assault troops, crammed like sardines into the Uganda, clambered down the sides of the ship on rope ladders into motor launches. The launches ferried the troops a short distance ashore, one group after another. 
As soon as they were ashore, the troops had orders to spread out fast. In that way they rendered themselves unsuitable targets for any attack by the Russian Cosmospheres patrolling miles above. Particle Beam weapons are devastating against concentrated targets, but very inefficient against personnel scattered over a wide area. By dawn other ships had also disembarked troops in the same manner. By the time daylight revealed what was really going on, it was too late. The British invasion of the Falklands was under way. Once the British got ashore with a sizable number of troops, Britain's chances of regaining control of the islands started increasing fast. Covert Russian help for the Argentines is much more feasible at sea and in the air than on land. In the past ten days we have heard about a number of devastating air attacks by the Argentines. Up to now the British have admitted losing at least five ships plus several helicopters and Harrier jump jets, but slowly the British ground forces have been reinforced and started advancing across East Falkland Island towards Port Stanley. As of today, May 31, British ground forces are said to be closing in on the main Argentine garrison at Port Stanley. The operation is being portrayed in the news here as a relatively easy task, but that is far from true. British casualties in the land battle have been far greater than admitted, and at sea the Royal Navy has taken very heavy losses that are not even hinted at so far in the news. Many ships have been badly damaged, and all, I repeat, all of the original contingent of the Sea Harrier jump jets have been put out of action. Both British aircraft carriers, the Hermes and the Invincible, have been rendered incapable of launching jets. The Harriers now operating around the Falklands are a different type from the sharp-nosed blue-painted Sea Harriers. They are painted in green and brown camouflage. My friends, they are United States Marine Corps Harriers, and they are operating from an American ship. The things I am revealing here, my friends, are at variance with official stories but this is the war you never see. Photos of British amphibious exercises taken at Ascension Island were passed off as pictures of the Falklands invasion. British Broadcasting Corporation broadcasting facilities on Ascension Island were taken over weeks ago by British military. Now we hear daily reports from Ascension Island that are claimed to be originating with the Task Force. Even more than usual, the truth has been the first casualty in the Falklands War. The Bolshevik military planners here and in the Thatcher Government in Britain are trying to find some way to use the Falklands War for their own purposes. Up to now they still are not slowing down in their fast timetable for Nuclear War One. Within a few short weeks there will be a highly visible clue to the status of the Bolshevik Nuclear War schedule. I am referring, my friends, to the upcoming fourth Space Shuttle flight. All the Space Shuttle flights up to now have been military in nature, as I have detailed in the past. The Space Shuttle is the Pentagon's only hope to regain a military toehold in space for the coming war. Now for the first time it is even being admitted that the next Shuttle flight will be military. Shuttle Flight No. 4 is presently scheduled for June 27 less than a month from now. If some excuse is found to delay the flight, it will reflect a slowdown in the nuclear war plans of the Pentagon, but if Shuttle No. 4 takes off on schedule, it will indicate that the Bolsheviks here are still sticking to their September war deadline. In AUDIO LETTER No. 73 I reported that for the first time the Shuttle had been successful in its prime military mission. A hardened laser-armed Super Spy satellite was orbited in March to obtain fresh reconnaissance data on Russia. It's the first updating of Russian target data since Russia destroyed America's spy satellites some four years ago. Target data from the new satellite is now being integrated into the Project Z nuclear war plan which I made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 73. Now Space Shuttle No. 4 is being prepared for a different mission. Under the Project Z war plan, 
the coming nuclear war will begin with a surprise nuclear attack by American stealth planes into Russia. They will attempt to knock out all of Russia's space bases, four Cosmodromes for rockets plus Cosmosphere installations in Siberia. If all goes as planned, all of these installations will be blown up with H-bombs simultaneously. As soon as that happens, the rest of America's nuclear arsenal is to be launched at Russia as I have described before. But there remains one weak point in the Bolshevik first strike plan against Russia. As it stands now, the Bolsheviks here will have to assume that the first phase of the attack plan has succeeded as of a given time. The reason is that the United States currently has no means of verifying if the initial stealth attack has succeeded. When Russia destroyed America's spy satellites four years ago, she also destroyed our high-flying early warning satellites. That leaves the Bolshevik war planners here without any way to tell if their bombs have exploded in Russia. Space Shuttle No. 4 is intended to solve that problem within weeks from now. The super-secret Department of Defense payload is a cryogenic infrared sensor system. It's designed to look down at Russia from geostationary orbit. It will detect the explosions of American H-bombs in Russia when it happens. The moment that it flashes a signal confirming the explosions to the Pentagon, the rest of the American nuclear first strike against Russia will be set in motion. In order to do its job, the Air Force infrared sensor has to be placed in geostationary orbit. That orbit is over 22,000 miles high over the equator. The shuttle itself cannot go that high. It can only go to low Earth orbit, perhaps 150 miles up. To take the Air Force sensor system the rest of the way, it has to be mounted on a rocket. The shuttle will carry the whole assembly, sensor system, rocket and all, into low Earth orbit. From there the rocket will take the sensor system out to the desired location far above the equator. My friends, as of now the countdown toward NUCLEAR WAR 1 is still being continued by the Bolshevik war planners in the Pentagon. The Falklands Crisis began as an effort to prevent or delay NUCLEAR WAR, but it may instead end up helping to set off that very war. If so, America's fourth Space Shuttle flight could turn out to be America's final manned mission into space. The Air Force sensor to verify success of America's coming initial attack on Russia will eventually be destroyed by Russian space weapons. Before that can happen, the Bolshevik planners in the Pentagon will try to set off Nuclear War 1. Topic No. 2 For two months now the Falklands Crisis has dominated the news. Likewise, the growing threat of nuclear war and mounting anti-nuclear sediment have been making headlines, but for millions of Americans a different crisis seems far more important. It is a long-term crisis which has been with us for many years now. This mounting crisis, my friends, is that of the crumbling United States economy and the United States dollar. Just this month, May 1982, there has been all sorts of bad news on the economic front. On May 7, the Government announced that unemployment, as officially calculated, had reached 9.4 percent, the highest level since the Great Depression. And just five days later there was another shock. Braniff Airlines abruptly terminated operations and filed for bankruptcy. It was the first time ever that a United States trunk airline had failed. Braniff, like more and more other businesses, was brought down by a mountain of debt. With interest rates remaining sky high in the midst of a deep recession, more and more companies simply cannot survive. Production cutbacks, layoffs, and bankruptcies are continuing to spread, and more and more people are losing their jobs. This recession is especially cruel because it is an inflationary recession. We're now living in the stagflation era which I warned about in my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar nearly ten years ago. The deliberate plans which were set in motion long ago to destroy the United States dollar are now far advanced. Since 1970 
The combined effects of inflation and taxes have cut the purchasing power of the dollar by 55 percent. A family of four living on $10,000 in 1970 would need well over $23,000 in 1982 just to stay even, and this historically unprecedented collapse of the dollar is continuing even as people are thrown out of work. For months now the battle over the Federal Budget has been dragging on day in, day out. We're told constantly that the budget is the key to bringing down the incredible interest rates that are killing the economy, and yet somehow it seems that no one can agree about what the budget should be. One budget proposal after another has come up for consideration only to be voted down. First there was the Reagan Administration budget, which went nowhere. Then all kinds of alternative budgets started being proposed. There have been Republican budgets, Democrat budgets, conservative budgets, liberal budgets, compromise budgets, and every single budget proposed so far has been voted down. There is more and more talk that the Federal Budget process has gone sour, that there is something fundamentally wrong. On May 28, the entity President Reagan denounced the budget process while he was in Santa Barbara, California to make a speech. He said, quote, The United States Government's program for presenting a budget or arriving at a budget is about the most irresponsible Mickey Mouse arrangement that any governmental body has ever practiced. It's called the President's Budget, and yet there is nothing binding about it. It is submitted to the Congress, and they don't even have to consider it." Unquote. My friends, please note carefully how this criticism by the President was phrased. I suggest you stop your recorder and play it back again. Because the entity Reagan was not just delivering a standard political tongue lashing at his political opponents, he was condemning the process itself, and he added, quote, I think that some real solid thinking should be given now to a budgeting process that befits the great government of a great nation, unquote. My friends, Reagan's choice of Santa Barbara, California for this statement was symbolic. It so happens that the so-called solid thinking he recommended for a new budgeting process has already been done, and as the President knows very well, that thinking was done in Santa Barbara at a tax-exempt foundation called the Center for Study of Democratic Institutions. That is where the secret new Constitution for America was written, including detailed new provisions for the budgeting process. Seven years ago in 1975, I published a pamphlet in which I reviewed the secret new Constitution from a legal perspective. The entire text of the new Constitution is contained in the pamphlet. If you have a copy, you can read about the proposed new budget process for yourself. It's all there in black and white. Important passages to look at include Article 4, the Planning Branch, Sections 2, 4, and 7, Article 5, the Presidency, Section 1, and Article 6b, the House of Representatives, Section 8. What you will discover if you trace through the budget process described in the new Constitution is very significant. When all the legal-sounding mumbo-jumbo is stripped away, the whole budget process turns out to be firmly under the thumb of the President. For example, Reagan complained in Santa Barbara that the President's budget, quote, is submitted to the Congress and they don't even have to consider it, unquote. My friends, the secret new Constitution would fix that. Article 6b, Section 8 begins, quote, the House shall consider promptly the annual budget." Unquote. What's more, the House has given no role in formulating the budget. If they dare to object to anything, the budget goes back to the Planning Board, so-called, controlled by, you guessed it, the President. The Reagan blast about the budget process is just the latest of an ongoing series of covert moves to pave the way for the new Constitution. 
What makes this one more significant is that it is tied in with powerful economic forces which are intended to speed up the process. Through months of contrived haggling, the kept Congress has been sensitizing Americans to the budget problem, and they have been doing it at a time when uncertainty over the budget is being blamed for worsening economic woes. Now along comes the President saying that the solution is to change the whole process. The growing budget crisis is also tied in with another major change which the entity President Reagan has been publicly advocating. That change, my friends, is the proposed Balanced Budget Amendment to our present United States Constitution. There is a drive underway right now to call a Constitutional Convention in order to introduce a Balanced Budget Amendment. Already most of the required number of states have ratified the call for such a convention. At the moment, if just three more states ratify it, a Constitutional Convention will be legally required to be called. The excuse for calling a Constitutional Convention would be to introduce the Balanced Budget Amendment. The problem is that once a Convention is called, there's no way to keep it from turning into a runaway Convention, rewriting the entire Constitution. In fact, that's exactly how our present United States Constitution was created. The original idea was to simply amend the Articles of Confederation. But once the Convention was through, a totally new Constitution emerged. Those who are behind the drive for a new Constitutional Convention now want the same thing to happen again, and if it does, they have their model for a carefully manicured dictatorship Constitution ready to go. In the past, there have been several other drives like the present one to call a Constitutional Convention. Each has been built around some pet idea of one kind or another, but each time the drive has fizzled out. Enough people have recognized the danger of a runaway Constitutional Convention to prevent its happening. This time, though, the danger is much greater than ever before, because this time the excuse for the proposed Convention is tied directly to people's pocketbooks. We're being told by various financial spokesmen on television that high interest rates are responsible for our economic woes, which is a half-truth. We are also told that government deficits are responsible for keeping those disastrous interest rates high. Then we are treated to the spectacle of a government seemingly unable to decide on a budget. And finally, whenever a budget is passed, it will contain the biggest deficits in history, well over a $100 billion. Against that background, the promise of relief by way of the Balanced Budget Amendment may prove too tempting to resist. If so, the drive to call a Constitutional Convention will succeed, and in the process we Americans will have sold our birthright for a mess of pottage. My friends, Although this may sound almost irrelevant right now in view of the specter of possible nuclear war by the end of summer, but never forget that the plans for war are the plans of men, nothing more. Those plans have a way of going awry in many cases, and in the case of those nuclear war plans, feverish attempts are underway to make them go awry. The Bolshevik war planners who control the Pentagon want nuclear war, but their anti-Bolshevik enemies who now rule Russia don't want war and are trying to prevent it. Likewise, the Rockefeller cartel here in America is in a power struggle against the Bolsheviks in an attempt to stop the war plan. If the Rockefeller interests do succeed in regaining control of the United States Government, they plan to stop the Bolshevik War Countdown, but the Rockefeller Group are fighting this battle only for themselves, my friends, not for you or me. It is they who are behind the secret new Constitution and the drive for a Constitutional Convention. If they succeed in beating the Bolsheviks here, they intend to capitalize. With their secret new Constitution, they plan to bring us under their domination more completely than ever before. In AUDIO LETTER No. 72 three months ago, I reported that a military coup d'etat was in gestation here in Washington. 
This is to be a coup by the Rockefeller cartel operatives within the government against Bolshevik operatives. The man in charge is a four-star general, Alexander Haig. Up to now the anti-Bolshevik coup has not been accomplished, but it is gaining ground. One major gain for the Rockefeller faction occurred last month while all eyes were on the Falklands crisis. On April 21 it was announced that Admiral Bobby Inman, Deputy Director of the CIA, had resigned quote unquote, effective immediately. Inman was forced out by the Rockefeller faction. He was replaced with lightning speed by John McMahon, a career professional with the CIA. It was the Rockefellers who created the CIA long ago as their own private detective agency, and now they are working fast to re-establish the control which they lost over the CIA three years ago. The infighting between the Rockefeller and Bolshevik factions within the government is growing more intense as the war fuse burns shorter and shorter. President Reagan and Secretary Haig are both under tight security. This summer of 1982 will be dangerous for them and for America. Topic No. 3. On the evening of May 16, millions of Americans tuned their television sets to NBC to watch the first installment of a special mini-series. It was a lavish portrayal of the travels and adventures of Marco Polo. For the next four nights, viewers were treated to a spectacular reenactment of Marco Polo's experiences as he traveled to China. Interspersed with those scenes of adventure and splendor were brief scenes depicting what happened to Marco Polo after he returned home to Venice. He dared to speak of places he had been and things he had seen that conflicted with the dogma of the day, and so he was tried for heresy. Today in 1982 we like to think of ourselves as too enlightened to close our minds like the inquisitors of Marco Polo, but the fact is that even today those who challenge preconceived notions are quickly branded as heretics and the like. There was a perfect example of this on Sunday morning, May 16. Ironically, it was the same day as the beginning of the Marco Polo series. My friends, I'm referring to the interview of Evangelist Dr. Billy Graham on the ABC News program this week with David Brinkley. Dr. Graham had just returned to England from participating in a five-day religious conference in Moscow, Russia of all places. He was one of more than 400 religious leaders from 80 nations who attended the conference. They were there at the invitation of the Russian Orthodox Church which sponsored the conference. A large fraction of those who attended were Christian leaders such as Dr. Graham, but there were also many representatives of the world's other great religions. They were not there to convert, to compete, or to condemn one another. Instead, it was a rare opportunity for these leaders to form bridges of mutual understanding, something which is all too often neglected in our world. It was a religious conference the likes of which the world has not seen for more than 80 years. The last time anything like this took place was before 1900. It was held here in America, in Chicago, and it was called the Parliament of Religions. There were some who feared that historic meeting of the minds and have condemned it ever since. As a result, it has never been repeated here in America, but I submit, my friends, that those fears were groundless. The Parliament of Religions did not destroy Christianity or turn Americans overnight into Buddhists, Muslims, or Hindus. What it did do was to establish bonds of understanding and respect for a while where they had been lacking before. My friends, it is a psychological fact that it is usually hard to hate another person if you get to know him. That is why any government bent on war tries to dehumanize and depersonalize the enemy. From the turn of the century onward, the United States Government has been controlled by elements who cherish war as an instrument of policy, so we see no more parliaments of religion here in America. By contrast, 
The government of Russia has undergone a drastic transformation in recent years. Russia's new rulers are Christians, as I have been reporting for nearly five years. After an agonizing struggle of six decades, these tough native Russians have finally gained the upper hand over the Satanic Bolsheviks there. Over three years ago the growing power of the Kremlin Christians started producing startling changes in public. For example, for Easter 1979 Handel's Messiah was performed in Russia for the very first time since the Bolshevik Revolution, and several months before that, in January 1979, the first legal shipment of Bibles into Russia since 1917 had taken place. The American Bible Society had asked the Russian Government for permission, and it had been granted. In AUDIO LETTER No. 44 over three years ago, I issued an appeal to America's Christian leaders to take a stand for peace before it was too late. What I suggested was a pilgrimage for peace to Moscow. Its purpose would have been to begin new ties of trust and understanding with the new Christian rulership of Russia. In that way, America's churchmen had the opportunity to take the initiative in a concrete way to help head off nuclear catastrophe. The response, as I reported later, was pathetic. To the everlasting shame of America's Christian community, only a tiny handful of Christian leaders expressed any interest at all. The Christian leaders of America by and large refused to hold out the hand of Christian fellowship to their brothers in Russia. But now a pilgrimage for peace has been made to Moscow after all. Since America's Christian leaders would not bother to take the initiative, those of Russia did so instead. They invited religious leaders the world over to make a pilgrimage for peace to Moscow, and they called their five-day assembly the, quote, Conference of Religious Workers for Saving the Sacred Gift of Life from Nuclear Catastrophe, unquote. When Billy Graham and some other Western Christian leaders arrived in Moscow, they soon discovered that it was not as they had been led to expect. Dr. Graham discovered that there was no attempt to restrict him in his religious messages. It was also allowed more freedom of movement than he had expected. On the Saturday evening before the conference began, Dr. Graham decided to pay unannounced visits to several Moscow churches. He went to three different Russian Orthodox churches and was shocked to find that they were filled to capacity with worshipers. As he said later in a news conference, quote, you would never get that in Charlotte, North Carolina." Unquote. Dr. Graham made a number of statements about his experiences in Moscow which all seemed to add up to one thing. There is a lot more Christian worship going on in Russia than he apparently expected and with greater freedom. When Billy Graham returned to the West, he must have felt a little like a religious Marco Polo. He had journeyed to the Forbidden East and discovered that it is not populated by gremlins and horrible beasts. Instead, he had come away with his heart strangely warmed." Quote, unquote. Perhaps he expected that the folks back home would welcome his unexpected good news. After all, our whole Christian faith is built on good news, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if that is what Billy Graham expected, he was sadly mistaken. When he returned to the West, he came back not to people eager to hear more of his good news, but to hostility and condemnation. We're always told that Russia is an atheistic country and beyond redemption. And so, by definition, Billy Graham's words about even limited religious freedom in Russia constituted heresy. He ran into a buzzsaw of critics determined to cut him down for saying a good word about Russia. It began right away with slanted reports about his statements in the major media. At one point Dr. Graham mentioned that in Russia his comments have been reported accurately in the press. By contrast, reports here in the United States were distorted and quoted him out of context. A perfect example of the treatment now being given Dr. Graham was his May 16 interview on ABC's This Week with David Brinkley. It was called an interview, but inquisition would be a better description. 
Every suggestion that Christians may be better off in Russia today than in the past was met with hostility. Time after time after time Dr. Graham was interrupted and attacked before he could even finish making his point, and many of the questions in the best tradition of heresy trials were designed to declare Graham guilty before he could even answer. To take just one example, at one point the ideological writer George F. Will mentioned an incident in which a peace protester was subdued by Russian police. Then he asked, and this is an exact quote, Given that evidence that there is no, and is not about to be, any peace movement in the Soviet Union, wasn't it clear to you from the start that this propaganda festival to which you were going was used simply to encourage a unilateral peace pressure and disarmament pressure in the West?" Unquote. My friends, a so-called question like that is the tool of a prosecutor, not an objective reporter. In one breath he claimed that there is no peace movement in Russia as if it were a fact, accused Dr. Graham of knowingly cooperating in Soviet propaganda, implied that all the world religious leaders who attended were stooges, and ignored the worldwide representation at the conference, saying it was all aimed at the West. Accusing questions like that were fired at Dr. Graham throughout the program. The only break in this inquisition came when Dr. Graham was removed from the discussion for a while. Then everyone else sat around and ripped him up one side and down the other in his absence for his heresies. In spite of the grossly unfair treatment, Rev. Graham made some very telling points. He mentioned that many other American Christian leaders were also at the Moscow Conference, and that still others have gone there separately, and he said there are many, quote, that would hold different viewpoints than what is being expressed here today. I'm a little surprised that we don't have some of those people, unquote. Perhaps Dr. Graham's most telling comment came fairly early in the program. Perhaps it was partly responsible for the frenzied bitterness of some of the attacks on him later in the program. Rev. Graham said, and I quote, Now when people go to China today, for example, they are applauded for going to China. It's wonderful to go to China. But there is not as much religious freedom in China as there is in the Soviet Union. Unquote. My friends, Billy Graham was exactly right in that statement. I have reported the same thing in my AUDIO LETTER REPORTS. The favorable image now being given to Red China is purely political and military in its origins. Unfortunately, some church-related groups are being used for these political purposes. What Dr. Graham may not know is the reason for the violent attacks he has endured lately. My friends, he has run afoul of the American Bolshevik nuclear war lobby here. They want to use you and me to do their dirty work for them against Russia. That is what their nuclear war plans are all about, and so at all costs they must not let us know that Christianity is reviving today in Russia. Even more, they dare not let the American people know that the true leadership of Russia today is Christian, because if we all knew that, my friends, we would never agree to their plans to destroy Christian Russia in a thermonuclear war. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've tried to bring you up to date on the progress of plans to throw America into a nuclear war against Russia. The countdown by the Bolshevik war planners who now control the Pentagon is still continuing. Their war plans have been damaged by the Falklands War but they are trying to turn that conflict to their own ends. Meanwhile, the countdown for Space Shuttle Flight No. 4 with its secret military payload is still on schedule. If the mission succeeds, the danger of nuclear war will increase dramatically. The summer of 1982, my friends, promises to be a dangerous time for America. As of now, Nuclear War 1 could be as little as three months away. But the Bolsheviks here have enemies who are trying to stop the war countdown. 
Here in the United States, the Rockefeller Cartel is continuing its power struggle to take back control of the government from the Bolsheviks. As part of that struggle, the preparations for a military coup d'etat led by General Alexander Haig are making progress. Likewise, the Russians are continuing to try in their own ways to prevent the war. Unlike the Rockefeller Cartel, the Russians are doing this for moral reasons. This month, May 1982, religious leaders from around the world gathered in a religious conference to take a stand for peace. If the conference had been held, say, in Washington, D.C., we would be hearing nothing but praise about it, but it was held instead in Moscow, Russia, and for that reason alone it has been condemned here in the United States. Those who dare to honestly report the favorable surprises they encountered there are being castigated as heretics. The most visible of these is Rev. Billy Graham for describing what he actually saw and experienced, honestly and without prejudice, he is being crucified on all sides. My friends, the same thing will happen to you if you dare to speak up about the things you know. But if you do not speak up to your friends, to your neighbors, to your relatives, they may never know why we are heading toward nuclear catastrophe. So I urge you to speak now and remember the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the Kingdom of Heaven. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.